14th will be heard. Thank you, thank you so much, Mr. President. As everyone in this room has heard, people throughout Missouri, throughout this country, and throughout the world, frankly, they've heard about Ferguson. And Ferguson was not known 30 days ago. Today it is known, and the nickname for um, Ferguson is now either Baghdad or Ground Zero. On August 9th, I received a phone call from a very good friend of mine, Alderman Antonio French. And he said to me, listen, there's something going on in your district and you need to get up here right now. And I was working on some district items at the time. It was a Saturday. It was a late afternoon. And um, I was trying to finish up and then I looked at my Twitter account and I started seeing the fact that a young man who was unarmed was killed by a police officer, Darren Wilson. I went up to Ferguson to what we call our ground zero. And there were literally thousands of people on a street called Canfield. It's a neighborhood um, of working people. It's a peaceful community, a lot of young people, a lot of families who work every day, who feel comfortable coming home at night. Ferguson is a place where there has not been a shooting or a murder in literally years. It's a former Sun downtown. Some people know what that reference means, some others don't. I talked to a former constituent from North County last week, a professor at Harris Stowe University who grew up in the Ferguson neighborhood and said that she saw the fact that there was racism in Ferguson when she was a little girl. And she is the one who referred to Ferguson as being one of the places where you could not drive or walk when the sun went down, a sun downtown. If you were African American, you could not walk down the street. I heard a story this morning on the bus on the way up here with my constituents of a man who said, if you lived in Kinlock, you could not walk over to Ferguson. In fact, his grandmother would get a cab because he went to basketball practice or football practice, I didn't remember which, but he went to practice. And the grandmother said, I'm gonna make sure I get a cab for you to go from your practice in Ferguson back home to Kinlock because I don't know what's going to happen to you. And so on one night when this young man missed the cab, he had to walk back home to Kinlock. And on the street called Dade, right off of what we call Airport Road, the police officers would stop and watch him all the way home. He was unwelcome. This was at least 40 years ago. We fast forward to where we are today where a young man who, by the way, graduated from Normandy High School, an unaccredited school district, turned around his life. It's evident because you can look at his Twitter account. And on his Twitter account, which I found about a week ago now, last year he had some very frustrating things that he was talking about, and then he was awakened by God. And he rededicated his life to God. And he decided what he was going to do is to make the best out of his life and become an electrician. Well, that was cut off very short. With his encounter with Officer Darren Wilson, his hopes and aspirations for a new life discontinued. I am witness to a community that has been treated terribly by a group of people who I call my friends, by a group of people that I have defended in this chamber. My constituents were called animals, and they were treated like animals. My constituents were called monkeys, and they were treated as if they were third class citizens in this world. And let me tell you why I know that it's because I was there. On August 11th, 
I was tear gassed along with my intern who's in the gallery and a young pastor who is also in the gallery on the fourth floor up here. For three hours, for three hours, while our governor, Jay Nixon, was at the mansion, chilling out. For three hours, a state senator who believes in the law, who believes in governance, who believes in democracy, who believes utterly in the First Amendment, was tear gassed for three hours, could not get out of a one-way street. North Wind's estates, one way in, one way out. And police officers, including our highway patrol, including the Missouri Highway Patrol, took part in tear gassing at least 100 people, if not more, and myself, my intern, and my young pastor. There is a senator who I communicated with, the senator from the 15th that night, while I was being tear gassed. And I told him I couldn't breathe. I told him it was very hard to breathe, taking in the gas. And he said, I'm your big bro. Take care of yourself, please, Senator. I'm your big bro. It's the Senator from the 15th. The next day, I had a meeting with the Senator from the 11th. And I was late for my meeting. I hate being late for meetings, but I'm thinking about the night before. And I was tear gassed, along with the people who I represent were tear gassed, not once, but several times, as our governor, Jay Nixon, sat by idly and did absolutely nothing. Unequivocally, he did nothing but sit and go about business per usual. He was reading to children throughout the state. He was at a concert at the state fair. By the time our governor responded, Jay Nixon, we had already been through three days of tear gassing, three days of people who are trying to demonstrate their right to voice their opinion, their right to assemble, their right to speak what is on their mind. He stood by and did nothing until this story became a global story. There are people in Gaza who are communicating with my constituents about how to protect yourself when you're tear gassed. People from Gaza. There are people from China who are communicating. There are people from Brazil and other countries who came to Ferguson because this is one of the most terrible atrocities that has ever occurred in my time as an elected official and in my time as just being who I am. I never thought that I would receive an in-kind donation from a constituent of a gas mask. I'd like to ask any of my colleagues in this room, has any of your, your Constituents, have any of them ever given you a gas mask as an in-kind contribution? I have. It's at home. I was wanting to bring it today, but I remembered our secretary would say we can't have any displays. But I have a gas mask now. I thought I never would need a gas mask. You know, I was in Iraq four years ago in Baghdad, and I was fired upon by militants, and I was in a bunker for an hour and a half, scared for my life. I have also climbed the Sydney Harbor Bridge, scary thing to do. I have been victim of clear air turbulence three times where we've literally fallen in a plane thousands of feet. None of those things, even added together, equate to what our governor allowed to happen in Ferguson. He was not paying attention to people who are born with a right to speak. I have had grown men crying in my arms. 
I have had women crying and mothers crying in my arms. Devastated. And let me tell you, I know where I stand on certain gun laws. I'm going to stay that way. But let me tell you, I understand what the injury is when one of your guaranteed rights is taken away from you. So many of you support the Second Amendment. And I support with all I am the First. And I never knew what it would be like to have a guaranteed right taken away from you. My constituents who are here today did not know what it would feel like, what the injury would look like and feel like when they could not speak and they were faced with tear gas and rubber and wood bullets. We didn't know that our activism and our peaceful displays would result in guns literally looking down our eyes. Literally looking down our eyes. Guns. And I had young people who were willing to die for justice. I had a young person, and he's definitely the example of many young people that I represent who said, I didn't think that I would make it to 21 years old, so I'm ready to die now. Let's do it now. I had young constituents because their rights, their guarantee at the time they were born to demonstrate peacefully was taken away from them. And as a response, they had literally guns pointed at them, ready to shoot, with no cause, nothing. Now we know on August 10th there was looting. And you know what we found out in our community? That the people who looted, they were not from Ferguson. They were not from the community. They were outsiders literally from other areas in, of this country and of my Senate district who decided to take advantage of a situation. But the people who are up here today, the peaceful protesters who are here today, they're actually the ones who stood in front of storefronts to protect them. Yeah, they did. As people were trying to loot, they stood in front, not knowing if they would die themselves or be shot at. They didn't know if that was going to happen, what danger would be presented. And here's what the Ferguson police officers did. What they decided to do is sit back, not do their jobs whatsoever. So as peaceful protesters are in front of business storefronts trying to protect, protect these establishments, Ferguson police officers did nothing and sat idly by. And the governor was doing his business per usual. Nothing. And as a result of many of these encounters that we have had over the course of the last 30 days, I do believe it's like 32 days at this point, but over the course of this time, I have learned a lot. One, I have become a mother to many. Didn't think that would ever happen. I have become a teacher. Never thought that would happen. And I've become a sister. I have spent the night out on the street with my constituents. I have been very glad that some in this room have taken the time to call and or visit. I am very thankful for the senators who have called, concerned about what's going on. And I, as I digress for just a short moment, I want to make very clear that the biggest issue we discussed this year was education. There is a distinct correlation with the level of education that this community has and the way some people responded. I want to be very clear on that. When we are in school, as our parents or our teachers have taught us, you have to seek a pathway to get to an end. There's always a means to an end. 
an outcome. And as I stated earlier, some young people, their, their means to justice was by giving up their lives, essentially. Now, we all, in our lives that we experience, want to maintain that quality of life. We want to see our children, our grandchildren grow and thrive. But in my community, there's been hopelessness for a long time. And so, you know, the governor established a state of emergency. You know, there was a state of emergency. The governor doesn't know what type of state of emergency that we have been experiencing. To be a black man in Ferguson and in North County, it means when you grow up, you automatically know that you're sticking your hands up. Don't shoot. You know that you're going to be stopped even if you don't have any warrants. If all your lights are on, you don't have any car violations, you grow up knowing already that you're going to be stopped and you're probably going to lose your job. It's how you grow up. They're preconditioned. They're preconditioned to know that they're going to be racially profiled. They're preconditioned to know that they're probably going to lose a job if one idle officer decides to stop them and hold them for 24 hours. There are people who are in this gallery today who have literally lost their jobs because police officers would not allow them to even go to work, would not allow them to go to the grocery store. There are people right now, and I hope the governor's office is listening as he has his SBA reform. There are people who now are facing eviction because they could not get to work. Now, governor, where is your plan? You've not had a plan, governor. You're a coward, governor. You're a coward. You're a coward to let the state of emergency of black people go on for so long. You've been in office for decades, and you've done nothing for black people. Nothing. You hide behind the curtains of your office. You let everyone play your cat's paw so that your handprints aren't on it. And finally, you got caught with your pants down, Governor. You got caught. You got caught. You got caught. And meanwhile, my community is hurting. And let me tell you, I've heard from some of our officers, it was only tear gas. It was only tear gas. I still can't speak. It was only tear gas. You can't throw tear gas in Iraq. You can't throw tear gas in Afghanistan. Do you know the trauma that you're adding to a person's life? When you throw tear gas at them, do you know? Yes, I was late for the meeting with the senator from the 11th because I was crying in my shower. I was crying in my shower because the government that I love so much and dearly decided to tear gas us for three hours. For three hours. For peacefully demonstrating. For three hours. And by the way, I'm not the only senator that was tear gassed. The senator from the 5th was tear gassed too. And the governor went on with business as usual. He did nothing. And so we look at how we're going to reform our laws at the local level, at the state level, and the federal level. And there are some changes that we have to make. And I want to work with every single legislator in this body and in the lower chamber, because there are some things that we need to be honest about. When I discovered what the injury was like to not be able to exercise your right to protest, peacefully protest, and to assemble, 
Think about your Second Amendment being taken away and how hurtful that is to many of you. To have your Second Amendment right to bear arms taken away. When the First Amendment right was taken away from me, it was like having both arms and both legs cut. It was an injury that I could never fathom. Loving the law, I could never fathom the law that protects every single one of us. As long as we are born citizens of this wonderful country with all of the challenges that we have, to have our First Amendment right taken away. And you know what? What's so sad? What's so sad is that many of my constituents didn't know that they had this guarantee. They didn't know they had this guarantee to demonstrate peacefully. They didn't know that. And on Wednesday, the third day of tear gassing, I'm on the phone with one of our federal leaders crying because there were tanks that were facing us. That was the day where everybody thought I was arrested. I wasn't. I had to take a shot of 1,800 with one of my citizens because it was hectic. It was, it was, so I had to take a shot. But I was on the phone with one of our elected leaders in Washington, and I was crying, and I said, please do something. The tanks are out. The guns are out. And they're facing us. So this whole time, the young people who I represent, what they're trying to do is express themselves. You know, we all express ourselves, some of us more than others, some of us more colorful than others, but we all get to express ourselves. And what has happened over the course of years, the, the real state of emergency, the state of emergency that our governor is not aware of, was met with tear gas instead of listening. The, the first thing that should have happened is we should have had counselors out on the ground to talk to people who were hurting. Because every single one of those people who I have been with over the course of the last 30 days, every single one of them, they are Michael Brown. They are young black people who are unarmed, who are just trying to survive. And wrong place, wrong time, you are Michael Brown. You're dead. You're dead. That's their reality. And so prior to Michael Brown Jr.'s death, there was already trauma. An uneducated community, our education system is subpar, struggling every day to make sure your utilities are on. You know, families that are torn apart for one reason or the other. I have people who are now homeless because of this tragedy, and it's pretty sad. I'm trying to figure out what to do with that. And then you add on the next layer which is a young black man laying in the ground in the middle of the street for four and a half hours, no cover, just tape surrounding his body, and people from the Canfield neighborhood and the surrounding area are just looking at a dead young man's body that lay on the ground with blood for four and a half hours. Now, I had a citizen who had an asthma attack just a little bit ago, and the response was immediate, an asthma attack. And we had paramedics up there within about five minutes. But there was a young man in the ground who lay there for four and a half hours. No response. So I go back to the governor, you know, he said in David Lieb's article, you know, I wanted to keep it a local issue. I don't remember the last time there was looting in Missouri where a governor has not responded. I, I don't somehow recall where there was looting by an entire area. I don't recall a time anywhere 
where a state senator was tear gassed and there's no response from the governor. I, I don't recall that. Day two of tear gassing, we were at St. Mark's Church and the governor went to uh, Greater Grace Church, I think, in Florissant, not Ferguson. And I want to remind you, I want everyone in this body to know, all of you, that our governor never showed up to ground zero until day 15. Until day 15. I want you to know that. The governor never showed up until day 15. Because we tracked it. We tracked it. Until day 15. Took George Bush three days to get to ground zero in New York. Or what about Katrina? You know, we were, as Democrats, we railed on, on President Bush. But it took Governor Nixon 15 days. Because I've been counting every single day. And I've been documenting every single day. And you know what? We have videos. And we have pictures. We have the highway patrol introducing themselves on their loudspeaker in the tank the day that we were tear gassed for three hours. And you know what? We're forwarding it, the Human Rights Watch. Because for this tragedy to happen in the state of Missouri, this is an issue that should go to the United Nations. This is a human rights violation which our governor allowed to happen. It is a human rights violation. And you wonder how I am right now. I'm a little bit frustrated. But I know that I have to be here for the people that I represent. I have to continue to be teacher. I have to continue to be mother. I have to continue to be sister. And most importantly, I have to continue to be the public servant that I am. From the very beginning, what I stated is, what would Jesus do? Jesus was always among the people. He was always among the most frail, the most vulnerable, the sick. That's what Jesus did. He was always among the people who were struggling. That's what Jesus was. Jesus was always with the people. And our governor didn't show up. Our legislators didn't show up. They just sat watching TV. They watched TV. And then they had pretend plans. Pretend. But you know what? The tactics, the tactical operation was off and flawed from the very beginning. From the very beginning. Because what you don't do to a community that is already struggling, already traumatized because of the way they were born and where they live, your first response isn't the National Guard or state troopers or 50 different municipal police departments. No, that's not what your tactical operation looks like. Your tactical operation is to get to the ground first. And I have not been into the military, in the military, but I do come from a military family. You need to make an assessment of what's happening on the ground first. That's what my estimation is. Never been in the military, just from a military family. Know what the situation is on the ground. The situation on the ground is a situation that calls for excessive abuse and force of police officers. Maybe you should have it. But in this community, what people are trying to do is to exercise their right to protest peacefully. The First Amendment for a reason. The guarantee that we are supposed to have to assemble and the people who I represent. Some knew about it, some didn't know about it, but like I said, the injury was so deep. Having a grown man cry in your arms 
I've never experienced that before. On a personal note, I will tell you the Sunday after Mike Brown was shot, there's an angry man who I saw at, um, he showed up to the town hall meeting we had last night. And he was one of the people who was ready to die. He was ready to give up his life. And there were two people who were holding him back from inciting police officers and the police officers who just stood in a row. This is myself and a, and a young gentleman by the name of Wesley Bell. And as people were very expressive in their wording and their distaste and distrust for law enforcement, I was pushing them back and I was telling them, we don't need another black death. No more. We don't need another one. Let's handle this the right way. And that moment, and this is my personal story, that moment, I, I never experienced this in my life, ever. I never experienced the fact that a woman and her touch can calm down a very angry man. I didn't know that. I didn't know that gently holding someone back from being shot can completely calm down a man. I didn't know that. And I've done it so many times because there's so many people who are angry and who need love and who need hugs and who need to be desperately understood. But again, our governor never took the time to understand the hurt and the pain inside of the people that I represent. And yes, I called him all sorts of names and I don't have any regrets. You get what you deserve. You get it. You get it. You get what you deserve. Again, my example, which you know, I, I thought would be most people's example, is Jesus. Being among the people, the most frail, the sickest, the ones with disease. That's my example. That's how I grew up. You're supposed to be like Jesus. And there are people who wear a badge or wear our little pins because they got elected and never showed up and have been posturing and pretending. And again, their tactical operation is completely flawed because they haven't taken time to understand the people that I represent. They've not taken that time. So I, I do want to backtrack because I didn't write anything down. I'm speaking from my heart today. And Harriet Woods always told me, if you speak from your heart, you can never go wrong. So I'm speaking from my heart. This situation should not have ever happened in any place in this state. It should not have happened. You know, it's been brewing for quite a long time in certain areas. And I, I want to make this very clear. If we continue to ignore situations like this, it's going to blow up. There are people in my district who have been targeted, over-ticketed, there's a story last night at the town hall meeting. There was a woman who was talking, chased down by police officers. Her front door was kicked in. She was arrested. And she's listening to the police officers say, what are we going to charge her with? What are we, just casually, what are we going to charge her with? She's looking after her son. She's trying to get to safety, and she was targeted. Her front door was kicked in, and she's listening to police officers say, how are we going to charge her? Well, when she found out what charge she had, oh, I'm sorry, what charges she had, she had five of them for doing nothing. Five for doing absolutely nothing. We are going to have to make some reforms that are smart and balanced. There are police officers who are my friends who are very upset with what has happened. Some of my constituents at the very beginning blamed all police officers and I told them that was the wrong direction. 
Not every police officer is a bad one. But the ones who are leeches and animals and sick people in nature and who have a disgusting character need to be cleansed from any police department that they sit in. There is a cleansing that needs to be taken, that needs to take place in police departments, at least in St. Louis County. I can't speak for everybody. But police officers are supposed to serve and be, again, as public servants, among the people. You know, National Night Out was a great example. I was hanging out with former state representative Chris Carter and we were going around to different neighborhoods, and everyone in those neighborhoods knew the local officer. No problem. Not an issue whatsoever. Good relationship, quality relationship, lots of follow-up, great, genuine, respectful relationships, honest, non-threatening relationships. So there is reform that can happen without hurting good officers. But we have to be open and we have to be honest. Ferguson is a city, a tale of two cities actually. It represents two kinds of thought processes. And because part of it is a little Pollyannish and the other is just real and live, we have to be honest with what we're thinking, what we're feeling, and move ahead. So I will tell you that I did not expect after such a long year dealing with education, it's taken, as you guys know, it's taken my life. And I thought the, the response um, from one of the St. Louis County judges, um, again, citing that our state commissioner on education is full of manure, um, that would be the end of, of my advocacy for certain things for a while. I thought I was going to be able to relax a little bit. And then the election came, and then Michael Brown was killed. And it's reminded me of why we are each here, and the responsibilities that we carry, and the oath that we take. And it is such a joy the most beautiful joy ever to be a servant, to be a servant without any air to ourselves, without any ego, but to be an average person among the people you are here for, the people who voted you in. When we can remove our button that we wear, take off our suits, wear some jeans and shorts and t-shirts. I did that for about 30 days. There are people who are in this gallery who did not know that I was a senator. They never knew. There is a kid up there, Haku, and some of T-Dub, low key, They're up there, and they had no clue who I was. On the second day after Mike Brown was shot, we were across from the police station demonstrating, and there was a, um, a prayer vigil about 3 o'clock. And you had all the wonderful churchgoers on one side, and you had all these youth in the street. We had already stopped traffic all day, and the police officers were fine with that. And then someone from the, the church going crowd said, no, get out of the street. They had no clue what we had been doing all day. And Haku was with his friends and they had their hands up, hands up, don't shoot. I, by the way, I have 18 month old children. When you say hands up, they throw their hands up. Five year olds, when you throw your hands up, they say don't shoot. Three-year-olds, when you raise your hands up, they respond, don't shoot. That is now the psychology of my community. 
Don't shoot. That's our first response. That's not supposed to be our first response, to raise your hands up and say, don't shoot. Because you walk around every single day as a living target. That is not the way that this world is supposed to be like. That is not how we are supposed to be living our lives. You see an officer and your first inclination is to put, throw your hands up and say, don't shoot. And this is the state that Governor Jay Nixon is responsible for. And we have 18-month-olds who are throwing their hands up, saying, don't shoot. I'm sure you guys have seen pictures of kids on school buses with their hands out of the window, don't shoot. Do you know what kind of conditioning that is? To just walk in a town and you're looked at as a moving target. The psychology from anywhere from 12 years old to 30 years old, you know that you're a moving target. You know it. You're going to lose your job for it. You're going to be kicked out of school for it. That is the tragedy that all of my constituents who are here today face. Moving targets. People who will not listen to them. People who will not understand them. But I brought them here today because I want you to understand the hearts of these people. If I ever felt that I was in danger, I would leave. If I ever did, I never left. I slept on the street with my homies up there. I wasn't scared. That was ground zero. Governor Nixon didn't come to ground zero until day 15. It was for five minutes. He was in fluorescent at a church for five minutes giving a speech. It was supposed to be a town hall, and then he left. And then there was a meeting at UMSL, which is in Normandy, not Ferguson, to have a press conference. And oh, by the way, at the press conference, he got booed. He got booed. Oh, sorry. But he was booed. And other elected officials were booed. And you know why? Because they didn't give a rat's posterior about how people in my community felt. They booed him. They booed him. I'm just telling the truth. Facts are facts. They booed him. You can't come. You know, Claire McCaskill came. No security. No cameras. No security. Claire, Claire McCaskill came. The day after people thought I was arrested, there's a young girl, Carissa. Um, I think what happened is that people, you know, mistake black women with natural hair. We all look alike. But Carissa is the one who was arrested, not myself. And she just got out of jail the next day, so it had to be Thursday, the first Thursday after Mike Brown's death. And she just got out of jail. Claire McCaskill was there. She was talking to people, trying to understand where they're coming from, what their needs were. And I said to Carissa, Carissa, I want you to meet your U.S. Senator. And Carissa says, no, 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 no. You know, I haven't had a shower. I've been in jail all night. No, no, no. And I said, Carissa, come here. And I grabbed her hand. And I said, you are going to meet your U.S. Senator now. So I walk her over, holding her hand. And you know what Claire does? She opens her arms. She embraces Carissa. Carissa starts crying and telling her story as a young person of how she's been demeaned and how other people have been demeaned. And Claire's just holding her. Governor Nixon never did that. No cameras, no security, nothing. And our US Senator embraced a young woman who was hurting, who had experienced years of trauma, years of trauma. And if it's okay for a statewide office holder to embrace 
someone who's been wounded for so long, why isn't it good for Governor Nixon? You know what I did for fun? Here's what I did for fun. So I took the, the um, ice water challenge, and before that, I said, Governor, if you want to throw the ice on my head, since I've been calling you names and all that, you can go ahead and do that. You know, you'd have two big buckets full of ice water, and you could throw it on my head. Let's do this for the people, right at ground zero. Yeah, that's the same silence I heard from him. That's the same silence I heard from him. So we went ahead and did the, the ice water challenge. We went ahead to do our business, and I know he's trying to make up now. It's a little bit too late. It's a little bit too late, Governor. It's just a little bit too late. He doesn't have any credibility in this community. You ask the people who are on the street protesting, the people who are willing to stay all night. And by the way, I have white men who protest all night long because of their black sons. This is not a racial issue, but for the racism within police departments. We have black, we have white, we have Tibetan monks who have come out to protest with us. Tibetan monks, they came all the way from India to protest with us. But Governor Nixon, yeah, I could hear the senator's pen touching his desk and we heard nothing, just like that. And we're not supposed to have those displays, but obviously you know that the vote in November will not be for any party. It will be for Mike Brown because of the gift that he gave us. Mike Brown gave us a gift, a gift. He's 18 years old. He gave us a gift. And the gift that he gave us is self-awareness, responsibility, fearlessness. He gave us a gift that being passive is no longer tolerable. It's no longer acceptable. He gave us a gift whenever any of us is treated unequal that we speak up instead of being so nice as we have been as people of color. We've been too nice. And you know what? We keep asking for permission. That's inside business, by the way. That's black people talk. We've been too nice, and we've been asking for permission. And let me just tell you, my community is not asking for permission any longer, Governor. We are not asking for anything. He didn't get us elected. He doesn't get any black elected official elected. You know, national TV, they said, hey, don't you think the party heads are going to get upset? No. I don't hear anybody complaining. And I, shoot, my community loves everything I'm doing and saying, by the way. They love it. Love it. So let me just tell you, I'm here for my community. Yeah, I'm a Democrat, and yeah, I'm a liberal, but you know what? I'm also independent, and I'm like water, and I'll flow wherever I need to flow to get what I need for my community. Best example, education policy. Best example. And you all know that I can work with you. And you know what? I think today is a wonderful opportunity to let the governor know to stay in his lane.